Hello, and welcome to this week's live timeline session. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know what this is about, I am going through one of the timelines from my method book, The Next Generation Clarinet Method. You can learn more about that at quickstartclarinet.com slash nextgenbook. Basically what it is is there's a PDF of a 74-page method book or so uh, with all of my favorite exercise organized by mastering or, or just sort of knowing the fundamentals, everything that there is to know about how to get a good sound, air, embouchure, articulation, sort of a quick how-to guide there. Then it's all about mastering the fundamentals through warm-up exercises and fundamentals exercises, trying to get all those things going well. And then the last third is applying it to actual short music examples. So it basically gives you a framework for really knowing how to play the clarinet. And along with it, there's videos of me demonstrating and sort of explaining each of the exercises and also timelines that tell you for your specific level how to go through the timeline. And I'm demonstrating the mastery timeline on these live sessions. And we're on session number 20 now. Uh, so there's been a whole lot. There's a playlist on the Quick Start Clarinet YouTube channel if you uh, don't have, like want to see all of them. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see what we have in store for today. Today is an exciting new day. We're on to a new set of warm-ups and sort of moving into the next section of the book, which will be great. So our first warm-up is page 33, the changing intervals long tones, and it says to pick uh, just one of them to do each day, uh, which will be great. So let me get up my timer. And I'll start the timer, and then I will pull up the long tones from the book. There we go. And I'm just going to start with A from page 33. And even though these are written in eighth notes, they're still long tones, so hold each note. Good start, good sustain, good plan to the next note. <laughs> with any long tone exercise, I'm stopping anytime I hear something I don't like, I'm, I'm redoing it so that I can get good control of exactly the sound that I want.
and that's the timer for that. And I still had three-ish measures left, um, but I'm going to stop there because that was all the timer was. I spent my time thinking about the good sound quality. That's really important. Um, I was also getting good connections and doing all that stuff, and that's all that counts. You just you take your three minutes to get what you want, and over many, many days, that time will build up. So next we have our technique. Uh, let me go back and see what the technique warm-up is. Uh, arpeggio is in a different key each day, great. And then the articulations, the short to fast or modes. I think I'm gonna do short to fast. Um, so page 39 and page 44, I'll remember that so I don't have to flip back and forth all the time. Oops, page 39, arpeggios, cool. And these are, of course, with a metronome. Um, this is a cool arpeggio exercise that I came up with that's sort of a combination of very common arpeggio patterns. Um, so let's give it a try. And it's written in 16th notes, so I'm going to go, let's go 86 on the metronome. It's going to be kind of fast, but let's see how it goes. I'll probably slow it down after this. And that was fine, but in the interest of getting more quality out of it, I'm going to go slower so that I can be more picky, I can hear more of the sound quality and the transitions. Um, this is an important idea that you can always get more out of an exercise, and usually by going slower, you're able to hear more of what you need to do to get more out of it. So let's give it a try. I'm taking a second to think about this new tempo. And even like the very first start of the first note, I want to sound good. I'm going to do just the second line again because that's a little bit harder. I'm also going to move my read up just a touch. It feels just a little bit unpredictable and I want a little more stability in it. Slowing down specific intervals that I don't like. I like that quite a lot. Now I'm going to see if I can do that all in the context. just to hear everything, another opportunity to make everything nice and smooth and high quality. something a little uh, different and kind of fun. Uh, I'm using Modacity to uh, time everything, and I'm going to actually play and record it through Mod Modacity and then slow it down. So let me get this metronome going, and then the recording. <laughs> how 
Audacity just plays it back right away. And I'm going to slow it down, uh, which is another really nifty feature uh, in here. Uh, by slowing down, first of all, by recording, you can hear so much more of what's actually happening. And by slowing it down, you can hear even more of what's actually happening. So ho hopefully this won't be too bad, which happens a lot when I listen to the recordings. Yeah, you can hear that start to it. And you can even see in the recording in the waveforms that it's not perfectly lined up with the metronome. Not bad, I want to check something in the middle there. I want to hear it in normal time now. Yeah, not bad. Um, it's a little limited by like the recording of my iPad and the speakers of my iPad and then coming through your speakers probably doesn't sound great. Um, but it was really insightful. Um, I'm a little bit too thin in like the E and the G in the second octave. My throat tone G is a little too throat tony. So now let me try it again and see if I can smooth those things out. And that start that I mentioned. My high C is popping out a little bit too, so I'm going to try to rein that in. Oh man, I should have recorded that. I think that was really quite nice. Um, I always say it's best to record when you feel like everything's going well. Or if you feel like there's just some things that you're not hearing that you don't like the way it sounds, but you can't quite pinpoint why you don't like it, that's a good time to record as well. And especially slow it down, you can get a lot of good insights. Um, but yeah, when I was playing it, it was like, it was fine. It wasn't like super great, but it was fine. And hearing those little things, I think actually really made a, a significant improvement. So that was nice. Uh, recording's really helpful. I didn't get to A minor. Um... So again, that's totally fine. I probably won't do that on a recorded session because I do want to do another key uh, next time. I'll probably, maybe this time we'll go around the circle of fifths uh, to get the keys that I didn't get in the ascending uh, scales, this playthrough of the timeline. So I probably won't record it, but definitely that's something I would come back to like the next time I do this warm up in a session. Um, but that was really, really useful to go deeper with C major and again, go deeper with the stuff rather than trying to do more is, is always a good thing to think about. Cool. On to articulation. Uh, so I think I said I'm going to do the short to fast and yeah, I'm going to do 68 on the metronome for that. And let's go to page 44. So this one's all about quality on the short notes, translating to speed on the, the fast notes, uh, particularly on the short notes too. It's the, the tongue is still moves really fast to get back to the read to make it short.
comfortable. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit faster with the tempo, both so I can get a faster, crisp staccato, and then also going faster on the sextuplets, which is going to be a challenge. So I'm bumping it up to 80, which is a good bump up. Um, also notice that I played the first note like several times just to like really get that dialed in and sounding great before I actually did the exercise. It's a really good idea to get creative about how you're practicing these. Again, you don't have to do just the whole page over and over. You'll actually get a lot better by picking some stuff out and being creative, whether it's just one note that you really get the quality that you want on, um, changing up the articulation, doing small sections, doing it in a different order. The more creative you can be about your practice, uh, the better. Uh, Ivy Art says hi, hello. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave any questions you have in the chat about any clarinet things, really. <laughs> start to the subdivision. Let me try that again. I'm trying a few different ways of counting and that's throwing me off sometimes. Um, but that was pretty okay, especially the articulation I think I'm happy with. So I'm going fast enough on the sex tuplets and that's feeling pretty good, um, but I feel like the sound quality isn't as clear and strong, so I'm going to see if I can move less of my tongue, focus there a little bit more, and get better sound on it. <laughs> time for that, um, which means we're on to the actual session now. Today's session <clears throat> is a little bit, uh, might be a little bit weird to do like this because it has to do with watching a video and I won't play the video for myself to have you watch me watch a video. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I, I think it'll, could still be interesting. So for today's session is page 50 to 52 on the how to practice music is the focus. And the purpose that I wrote is review the information on these three pages and consider how well you are implementing this practice frame, framework. Even on warm-up exercises, it is important to always be looking for the opportunities for improvement. If you don't know what could potentially be better, then how, you, how can you ever expect to make it better and become a better player? Let me read that last sentence again just because I read it bad. If you don't know what could potentially be better, then how can you ever expect to make it better and become a better player? So let me go to page 50 in the book, and I think I'll sort of talk through this, and maybe I'll do some of the reflecting on my own. So this is the How to Play Music Triangle. And let me go ahead and read what this is about. And let me check, cool. Uh, how to Play Music Triangle. Just like the How to Play Clarinet Triangle, we can use the How to Play Music Triangle to guide our study of music and help us to play with more musical clarity. 
Just about every aspect of music can be broken down into one of these three categories. The upcoming four opportunities for improvement and three eyes of practice cover the what and how of mastering these elements. Be sure to watch the video on page 52 to see how it all fits together. Cool. So the how, how to play music triangle is rhythm, notes, and style. And I have it as sort of like a Venn diagram. The rhythm and notes sort of create the precision. The notes and style are expression. The rhythm and style are energy. And then it all comes together to be sort of your musical interpretation. Um, I'll give you the funny backstory about this, how it became a Venn diagram. So when I first made the uh, Next Generation Clarinet Method, I was using Microsoft Word. And I was trying to make like a triangle diagram in Word. And there were some nice diagrams and I could have like drawn lines, but that looked like just kind of sloppily thrown together. Uh, so there was this Venn diagram thing and that worked really well to put like rhythm notes and style, but then there was the overlapping bits and I was like, well, it's weird that they're overlapping, but there's nothing there. So I sort of made up this precision expression energy and the musical interpretation. But the same thing's true for the how to play clarinet triangle, by the way. Uh, but I think it's interesting how it came together and I sort of just came up with it when I was making it, but I haven't really thought about it too much more since then, so I want, I'm going to sort of think about it now. Um, I think that's a good thing to ponder on this page is like, what is the precision, the energy, the expression, and how is that true that that's made up of like the rhythms and notes? So I think w when it comes to precision in terms of rhythm and notes, I think it's very much about a how to do it as well as what it creates. So when you play your rhythm and notes very accurately, you can make very precise music. And it's maybe not good music per se, it's not necessarily musical, it's just very precise. I think computers are the best at precision when it comes to rhythm and notes. You can put any rhythm and any notes into a notation software and it like nails it. Um, the Intonation of the notes is very precise, at least in an equal temperament perspective. The rhythms are perfectly subdivided, maybe not grouped the best, but they're, they're there. So yeah, I think precision is very much about those things. Whereas style, like dynamics, it's harder to be precise. Like you could say a specific decibel, but that's, that's not really what dynamics are about, right? So notes and style being expression, let's think about that now. So... Of course, how high the notes are is expressive in a way. The shape of the notes, the key of the notes, there's definitely expression in that. Uh, the style, of course, is expression, rhythm, articulation, or uh, sorry, <laughs> dynamics, articulation, definitely style and, and expression, and that style creates the expression. And I think pairing it with the notes, I think, makes sense. Um, think about like crescendoing through an octave leap. D, uh, like there's there's that support there. Like that's much more expressive than just where it's just the notes. So yeah, putting the, the style with the notes especially creates the expression. Yeah. And then style and rhythm being energy. I think that makes very good sense too uh, with how the articulation overlaps with the, the rhythm. Say you have like a uh, fast like galloping rhythm, but you play it with very legato articulation. Like that's a very weird, almost contrasting energies. Whereas if you uh, make a little bit more staccato articulation, and maybe even a little accent, that has a very different energy to it, even though it's like pretty much the same rhythm. Uh, tempo is a part of style too, so obviously changing the tempo. Uh, that's changing the uh, articulation and tempo on the same rhythm. So yeah, it absolutely brings energy. And also of course changing the rhythm if you do. is different than the different kind of energy for it, for sure. And yes, of course, it all overlaps into your musical interpretation. So those are the things to be thinking about to get your musical interpretation. Okay, I, I think that all makes sense. 
Uh, now onto the four opportunities for improvement. So this is what I wrote on the page. Uh, the how to play music triangle categorizes the important parts of the music, while the four opportunities for improvement helps us to actually put that into action. As I practice, I use this as a checklist, always asking myself what could be better about the four categories. This is greatly beneficial for making practice more deliberate and therefore more efficient. If you can get these four steps correct, consistent, and comfortable, then you are performance ready. And there's a link there for the uh, one of my videos about the three C's. You can find it by searching uh, quick tips, the three C's to know you are performance ready. And maybe putting quick start clarinet in the search too is helpful to find my video. <laughs> Great. So number one for the four opportunities, rhythm. Do you know how to count all of the rhythms? Are you confident about when every note starts and how long to hold it? Can you comfortably and confidently play with a metronome? Yeah, so that's that's what rhythm's all about, uh, being accurate. One other thing about rhythm that isn't sort of explicitly stated here, but it's definitely worth thinking about, is how you're grouping and how you're leading. Um, not just are you confident counting the rhythms, but can the audience or somebody listening really clearly feel the steady beat in what you're playing? Because that's what really good rhythm makes it so it's predictable and clear to the audience where the next note's gonna be and where the next beat's gonna be. So they can sort of tap along and follow along uh, or maybe even be able to dance to it if the character of the music is appropriate for dancing. Number two for the four opportunities, sound quality. Do you like the overall sound? Is there a good connection between all of the notes? Is your sound consistent from note to note? Is each note relatively in tune? Yeah, this is great. And something else that just came up to me as I'm thinking about these is reflecting on how much I actually do these in my practice. And that's exactly what you should be doing too as you go over this. And that's what I mentioned in the timeline is to ask yourself, how much do you actually implement these ideas? Maybe you know about these ideas, but how much do you actually implement them? Um, which I think I do pretty well with sound quality, especially sound quality is one of the top things that I'm always thinking about. Um, rhythm, I think about, but I don't always judge the quality of my rhythm necessarily. I'm, I'm counting and playing the right rhythms, but maybe I could go more in depth with like recording with the metronome and seeing how really even it is. Uh, number three is notes. Do you know what key you are playing in? Have you listened enough so that you can hear if you play a wrong note? Are there any accidentals carrying through from earlier in a measure? Yeah, that's great. So that's all the very straightforward note stuff. Again, I'll give you a little uh, extra bonus behind the scenes here if you're watching this. Uh, it's not just are you playing the right notes, but it's how confident are you playing the right notes. Uh, we all have the thing where like, oh, I, I played all the right notes, like yes, but you feel like you got lucky and you don't want to be feeling that way when, when you're practicing. It should be very confident, very controlled, like you were deliberately making every note correct. You deliberately knew where your fingers were going. And speaking of fingers, that's another bonus on the note side of things, how comfortable and relaxed are your fingers. The more relaxed your fingers are, the faster you'll be able to play, the longer you'll be able to play without getting tired, and even more importantly, you won't injure yourself because you're nice and relaxed. And then number four is style. Do you know what tempo you're going for? Are you playing the correct articulation? Are you doing the dynamics? Do you know where the phrases are and what's happening in them? I love that last one especially. And maybe even more specific than that is, do you know what the purpose of every note is? Is this note building tension towards the top of a phrase or releasing tension at the end of a phrase? Uh, those kinds of stylistic things really make a difference. That ties a little bit into the rhythmic groupings as well. Um, but yeah, that even do you know what tempo you're going for? Oh, it's such a good one to know. If you play something, you can ask yourself this tempo question and maybe think, well, I don't even know if I had a tempo in mind. What tempo do I actually want this to go? Am I with that metronome on the tempo? So yeah, th these are really good things to be thinking about. And I think for me personally, um, I could definitely dive more specifically into all of these. And I think I'll try to demonstrate that in future sessions uh, as we start to dig into these little musical examples. Um, yeah. Cool, just four minutes left on this session actually. It's, it's definitely going by quick. Let me finish up this page and go on to the next. Uh, this says, the following pages have some short musical studies that focus on each of these categories. They start pretty simple and then get progressively more complex within each category. 
but first we need to know how to actually make the improvements. It is great to be clear about where the opportunity for improvement is, but that won't help much unless you know how to make those improvements. That's where the three eyes of practice comes in. And that's the next page, the three eyes of practice. Once you have identified an opportunity for improvement, whether that is steadier rhythm, smoother sound quality, etc., you need a plan to make the improvement. Identifying is about getting clear about what can be improved. Then isolating is about making that improvement. Simplify the music however you need to do it correctly and confidently. If you can't do it correctly while going slow, just counting it, or however you have decided to simplify it, then you won't be able to do it correct in context. Finally, integrate the improvement into the surrounding music so that you can be sure that it is correct, consistent, and comfortable. And there's a little chart to help you with this. So identify is the first one. Uh, find the passages that are causing difficulty. What doesn't feel comfortable to play? Where are you making mistakes? That's what it says on the page. But to elaborate a little bit further, identify is all about getting crystal, crystal clear about what the problem is. So if you play something and you're like, oh, I didn't like how uh, these notes felt. I felt uncomfortable in these notes. That's a sort of surface level issue. You can get more clear about that. Maybe it's like, oh, I didn't feel comfortable there because I was crossing the break. And then you can get even more clear. I didn't feel crossing the break because my fingers aren't coordinating perfectly. Maybe my thumb's moving a little slow. My first finger's moving a little bit slow. Some, some finger's not coordinating well. Or maybe it's not even a finger problem at all. The notes feel uncomfortable, but actually it's because your embouchure is changing. So getting really specific and identifying the problem then you isolate and improve it. So say we've taken like this beat of notes didn't feel good. Now we know it's just the crossing the break that's the problem. So that's isolating and identifying and getting really down to the point. Now to improve, uh, it says select a method to improve the difficult section you have isolated. Go slower, count the rhythm, make it easier and gradually move towards the end goal. So what this would be for crossing the break is selecting a method. So maybe you've identified that it's crossing the break and it's an embouchure problem where you're tightening up the embouchure as you go over the break. So what you're gonna do is go really, really slow, make it a long tone exercise, and maybe let's get even more creative and let's start on the B, get that sounding really well, go down to the A, and then go back up to the B and see if you can keep it all steady. So that's something that you might do to actually isolate and improve that. And then once you get the long tone version from B to A going really well, then you slowly move towards the end goal of being able to play the 16th notes from A to B or whatever it may be. Um, so maybe that looks like you did B to A to B as long tones. Now do A to B as long tones. Now put a metronome on, still going slow, still long-ish notes, but now it's rhythmically in time. A, B, A, B, A, B. Gradually speed it up. A, B, A, B, A, B. Uh, and then next thing you know, you're able to actually play it da dum da dum and go as fast as you need to. Then the final step is to integrate it. For integrating, play the isolated and improved section in context with the material around it. Make sure the improvement sticks when playing a larger section. So integrating that, like say it's four beats or four notes in one beat, it's four 16th notes, A to B is in the middle of there. So now you have the A to B going really well. Now you need to make like, say it's G, A, B, C. You have to get those notes on either side of it to go well. So that's integrating it, adding just one note at a time on either side is a good place to start. Um, then maybe do one beat on either side. So do the, the whole quarter note beat before, all four 16th notes on that beat, the full quarter note beat after. And then you can start to get bigger with it. Maybe do a whole measure on either side. And if you can do a measure before the problem area, all the way through a measure after the problem area and it's fine, then you're probably in good shape and can now do the whole phrase and see if it sticks in the whole phrase. So that's integrating. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, watch this video for a more in-depth overview of how to make your practice practicing productive and to see how the four opportunities and three eyes work together. And this is my practice framework video. Uh, let me get the actual title of that for you too, if you're interested. Um, the title is how to practice any piece of music, no matter the difficulty. Uh, this is one of my absolute favorite YouTube videos. So if you're watching this video or going through this timeline yourself, I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, if you have the next generation clarinet method, you can click the link in it. Uh, if not, 
go to YouTube, search quick start clarinet, how to practice any piece of music, no matter the difficulty, and it should come up. And that's the time for this session. Uh, that was a good review, actually. Some stuff that I thought of uh, will help me be in the right sort of mindset to help you all as well with uh, how to really focus on the musical examples that we'll get into next week in the next session. So I hope you found that interesting. Uh, if you don't have the Next Generation Clarinet Method, again, go to the link in the description. There's also a link to get sample pages in the description uh, if you wanna just sort of see what it's like a little bit. Uh, the sample pages unfortunately don't have the like videos that you can click on, but these timeline session videos are pretty instructive as well and available to everybody. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next week on the next live timeline session where we're gonna get into some of the musical examples and work on applying our mastery of the clarinet to some music. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.